Hi, my name is Corey Dow, and I'm a technical marketing engineer with HPE Aruba Networking. Today we're going to cover an important update with AOS CX 10.14.1000. The feature is called BGP over GRE tunnels with IVRL. Okay, and for the agenda today, we'll provide an overview of the feature, the use cases, uh, details and caveats, how the feature is configured along with best practices, and troubleshooting information along with a demonstration. Okay, in this section, we'll, we'll provide an overview of the feature and why it's important to customers. Okay, and before we get started in the, in the overview section, uh, we just provided a definitions page here just to illustrate the, the key acronyms that we have in place uh, for the feature as we documented on the title slides. So uh, BGP stands for Border Gateway Protocol. Uh, also down here below, so the VRF is virtual routing and forwarding. Uh, IVRL stands for inter-VRF route leaking, and there's two different versions of it. There are two different ways to configure it. One is dynamically and one is statically. In this presentation, we'll, we'll be covering how to do it dynamically using a border gateway protocol. And this slide covers the platform support for the feature. Uh, you can see BGP over GRE tunnels with IVRL. This is new to 10.14.1001 release. Uh, and we prioritize the support with the 83.25 and the 10K platforms that you see pictured here. Uh, the campus switches don't support this feature and some of the other data center switches don't support this feature as of this release that would change in the future. Uh, there's no reason that the feature couldn't be provided on the campus switches as well that support uh, BGP and GRE. It's just that we prioritize this with the data center switches that you see listed here. And on this slide, we'll provide an overview and a review of the existing implementation. Uh, so uh, the feature, as we mentioned, is targeted toward the 8325 and the 10K platforms. And in the industry, it's, it's known uh, by the common term of VRF aware GRE tunneling. And so this is required for applications that require multi-tenancy support, in this case, uh, for the data center. Um, and this is a deal enabler for managed service providers. Uh, we were told uh, at least $2 million in, in total business revenue and future revenue streams we could achieve just by releasing this feature, which does also provide parity with other vendors. And it's used as an alternative to VXLAN, where VXLAN is not the preferred tunneling method. And so that's the one, the first component to this new feature support. And then the other areas of the code that needed to be changed is the inter VRF route leaking support. So the requirement for this is to have the GRE underlay and the overlay VRFs in different VRFs. But as you can see, as the existing implementation, so the uh, you see the tunnel that we have here, we've got a VRF attached uh, to blue. And with the source IP uh, 1111 and the destination IP 2222. And so for the existing implementation, the tunnel interfaces that you see here for 100.111 and 100.112, all of these needed to be in the, C the same VRF. So in this example, we've, we're using VRF blue or, or the default VRF, but all of the, uh, the interfaces had to be in the same VRF for, for this to function correctly. And so the new requirement is to decouple the transport VRF uh, or the underlay from the tenant VRFs uh, in the overlay. So, so what we want with the new feature support is, is to have the transport network connecting to, you know, say the OSPF uh, area that you see here would be the underlay network in, say, the default VRF or a named VRF. And then have all these, these other tenant networks like the 105 and the 205 network just exist in different VRFs uh, corresponding to, to different tenants. So uh, taking a closer look at the enhanced implementation that we provide to support in the, the new release there. So the default or a named VRF becomes the underlayer transport VRF, as we see here in this uh, tunnel configuration. Uh, so we are specifying the transport VRF, uh, specifying default. Uh, it could be default or it could be another named VRF. Uh, and so what we're doing is accomplishing the goal of keeping the underlay network uh, separate from the overlay networks. Uh, so we have two tenant VRFs here. So the, the blue VRF and the uh, orange VRF. And then we have a corresponding transport VRF uh, for each of these. And then also a corresponding uh, source IP, which would be reached through the default VRF. Uh, and we'll see this in more detail as we go forward with the, the presentation. 
and just uh, covering the additional bullets here. So overlay networks are plumbed using the additional VRFs, blue and orange, to provide the multi-tenancy support, as I just mentioned. And the underlay destination networks are leaked into the corresponding tenant VRFs, optionally using route maps for filtering purposes. And then finally, BGP sessions are established over these GRE tunnels. In the section, we'll highlight common use cases for the feature. So some common use cases for why customers want to use multiple VRFs with GRE tunneling. So in general, you may have a shared physical data center environment with multiple tenants. As you can see in this example on the right, we have three tenants, tenant A, B, and C, which have the default VRF corresponding to the external networks and the firewall. These would be considered the underlay or the transport VRF. And then we have corresponding tenant VRFs, VRF1, VRF2, and VRF3, which are used for segmentation purposes. And so the use cases for leaking routes, not so common between VRFs, but some shared services like DHCP or maybe NTP, you may want to leak between the, the VRFs. And for this feature, IVRL is used to leak the tunnel destinations and the next hops from the transport VRFs into the tenant VRFs. And the use case for GRE tunneling, this would be when you have a firewall requirement to route traffic for shared services between the VRFs. Also, when the firewall is the main exit choke point towards the external networks, either the intranet or the, the internet. In this section, we'll cover the details and the caveats for the feature. So one of the first caveats that we have with the feature is that the tunnel source IP addresses must be unique within the different VRFs, as you can see in figure two. So in figure one, we've got the source IP 1111 used for both the blue and the orange VRFs. Uh, this isn't supported because as we can see, the transport VRF is the same for both. And so these, these source IPs do need to be unique across VRFs, which is what we were showing here in figure two. So with VRF blue and VRF orange, we have a, a different source IP address that we see listed here. And then what is supported as well in figure three, as we can see here is where we have the same VRF, but we're, we have different uh, tunnel destination IPs. So in that case, they can use the same source IP within the, the transport VRF. And for unsupported features at present, and again, subject to change in future releases. So we do not support GRE encapsulation or decapsulation through the DSM uh, on the CX-10000 series. Uh, GRE over IPv6 is not supported. Uh, we cannot enable QoS on the tunnel interfaces. Uh, MPLS over GRE is not supported, and multi-point GRE to reach multiple remote sites is not supported, uh, along with fragmentation of the jumbo frames, and finally, multicast over GRE is not supported. Okay, so let's uh, dive down a little deeper into the configuration aspects for the feature. To keep things simple, we're just using a single tenant VRF, VRF1, as you can see here in the diagram, uh, with also a default VRF where we're, we're leaking the destination uh, for the, the tunnel interfaces uh, through the, the route map, and you'll see that in a moment. Um, so we've got the tunnel configurations here uh, corresponding to the loopbacks. You can see a loopback zero here, 1111. It's in the default VRF. And for the tunnel configuration, we've, we've specified the transport VRF default uh, in both cases. Um, so the tunnel source and destinations are, as you can see here, and then we have uh, each of the two VRFs, so VRF1 in, in both cases, um, and then along with the default VRF. And so we have route distinguishers here uh, with the address family IPv4 uh, unicast. And we'll see in a moment where we're leaking the destination, the tunnel destination, as well as the next stops for the, the, the GRE tunnel. And so we've established a prefix list here. So you can see that we're permitting the destination on uh, leaf one uh, to leaf two. So we're permitting 2222 two, two that corresponds to look back zero on leaf two. And not pictured in the diagram, but we're also leaking the, uh, the next hop network that's used to reach that tunnel destination. And so we're leaking both of these through, through the, to the tenant VRF from the default VRF, uh, as you can see pictured here. 
And then we've also specified uh, the SEC community, no advertise. And this is just to make sure that we don't have the route being advertised uh, both in BGP and also in the, in the IVRL. And then finally, we have the BGP configuration here. You can see that this is a eBGP. Uh, in reality, it doesn't matter. This could also be a IBGP for the data center environment. Uh, so what, what we've got the BGP configuration here where we're redistributing the, the route map and leaking the, the corresponding uh, tunnel destination. And then the next top, as you can see there, and important as well, you can see where we're using the tunnel IP address that you can see there matching as the, the, the source of the, the, the BGP neighbor. So this is where we're establishing BGP over the GRE tunnels and then redistributing the connected routes that we have in the, in the environment. So the 10.1.1.0 and 10.1.2.0 networks. In this slide, we're showing the equivalent configurations for some of our other vendors and how they implement the feature. So you can see in our case, we've used the transport VRF default as a way of, of implementing this feature. So for the AOS S switch line, we don't have any equivalent feature support because the VRFs are not supported on that product line. And for Juniper or Juno S, you can see that we've got a feature identified here where you specify the routing instance and the destination uh, routing instance name. And then for Cisco, products, the iOS and NXOS series, you can see the equivalent configuration here where we're using tunnel VRF blue, and then that Cisco NXOS uh, tunnel use VRF green, and then also for the Cisco iOS uh, ASR device, um, you specified the VRF forward and green CLI command. And for H3C, uh, they implement the same feature as you can see here, we specify the tunnel VPN instance blue in this case. And on to the best practices section. So for best practices that we've already mentioned, so you must use the unique tunnel source IP addresses as discussed in the details section. So when you have two different VRFs and you're specifying the source IP, as you can see here, we've got a unique source IP address that we're using for the default VRFs. And then you also want to configure the IP MTU in the tunnel interfaces. And let's take a look at troubleshooting this feature. So in the cases where the tunnels won't come up. So in figure one here, you can see where we've issued the show interface tunnel brief command. And so we've got the, the two tunnels corresponding to the two different VRFs that are configured here, and they're both down in this case. So when you see this, we wanna uh, first check that the route maps permit the correct destination loopback IPv4 address, and that they're leaked from the default VRF. And so we want to also check that the VRF import and export statements are correct. And we'll know this if the tenant VRF doesn't contain any entries. So in figure two below here, we've incorrectly exported route targets 3100 instead of 0100. Uh, so that was one reason why, why it wouldn't come up. And so we also must have loopbacks assigned to each VRF or BGP sessions will not establish. Uh, each VRF needs two loopback entries, as you can see here, configured in figure three where we've got an underlay VRF and also a corresponding loopback uh, IP address in that corresponding overlay VRF. If you don't do this, then you'll see that the BGP neighborships won't establish correctly. And so for figure four as well, you wanna check that the MTU in the underlay to make sure that the OSPF neighbors are not stuck in exchange state in this case. So we were missing the, the MTU 9198 in uh, one of the links and that caused this to not come up. And so you also wanna make sure, uh, not pictured here, but the prefix list include the correct entries for the loopbacks on both sides of the tunnel uh, and the next top networks. And for continuing uh, troubleshooting, when the tunnels won't come up, you wanna verify that the routes are imported correctly into the corresponding VRFs. So in the example below, we can see that tunnel destination IPv4 uh, 2222-30 and next top 1011 zero slash 30 prefixes have been leaked into the VRF one and they correspond to the default VRF as you can see here. So this is an example of where it's configured properly. So in addition to the commands that I just showed you on the previous slide, just some additional show commands that are useful uh, as more shortcuts than anything to look at the configuration. So you don't have to scroll through the entire configuration. So in this case, you can do show run interface tunnel It'll dump all the tunnel uh, interface configurations you know, on the system uh, as 
well as the show interface tunnel brief to indicate the status of the tunnel if it's up or down. And then the show run interface loopback will dump all of the loopback configurations for the device. Uh, it's a useful shortcut. And then the show BGP VRF command uh, for the IPv4 unicast address family will just dump the uh, routing tables and the next tops for the uh, for the prefixes that you see listed here. Okay, and let's proceed with the feature demo so that we can see how this works. So to keep things simple, we're just using a single tenant here with the VRF1 and the default VRF. And we'll have tunnels established uh, with BGP over the GRE tunnels uh, with LEAF1 and LEAF2 connecting to just a, a separate spine switch uh, in the default VRF uh, with OSPF areas, as you can see here. Uh, and then we've got so the loopback zero addresses that you see here are 1111 and 2222 uh, in both the default and the VRF1. Uh, as we mentioned uh, previously, the tunnel source IP address must be unique uh, for these different VRFs. And uh, so the point to point networks for the OSP appearing in the default VRF, you can see uh, A1 and A2 here. So that's to be 10111 and 10112. And then for connecting, Leaf two with uh, spine one, we're using twenty one 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 zero, so so one both one and two uh, addresses there, and then we've uh, have the tunnel destination loopbacks and next tops exported via the route map from the default VRF and imported into the tenant VRF, and you'll see that uh, in the demo as well, and then prefix list to use to narrow the scope of IVRL so that you're only leaking what's required for the configuration. And then finally, BGP peering and updates are configured to use the tunnel interfaces, so 100.1.1.1 and 100.1.1.2 addresses. And then finally, the 105.1.1.0 and 205.1.1.0 networks are connected, networks attached to overlay VRF, VRF1, and distributed via BGP. So this is what you'll see in the, in the demo. Okay, so let's proceed with the demonstration. Uh, so we've got a number of windows here corresponding to the devices that we have active in the topology. So you can see we've got uh, spine one uh, on this top terminal session. We've got leaf one and then leaf two in the middle tier. And then uh, the two VMs that correspond to the, the hosts that are connected to each switch. So VM one is connected to leaf one and then VM two is connected to leaf two. And so what we're showing here is just the LLDP information for the configured uh, ports. So you can see one, one forty seven connects to leaf one and 1148 connects to leaf two. And then for leaf one, so port 114 connects down to VM one, and then 1144 is used to connect to spine one through port 1147. And then for leaf two, port 111 connects to VM two, and then 1148 connects to spine one uh, for leaf two. Okay, so now we're just showing the, the OSPF neighborship for both LEAF1 and LEAF2 and the configurations uh, for the, the ports. So you can see for port 114, it's connected to VLAN 105, and then 44 has the, the IP uh, configuration that you see there connected to OSPF uh, area zero. And then we'll just look at LEAF2, same ports, uh, port 111. So you see VLAN access 205, and then the interface configuration for 148 is using a 2111 slash 30 versus a leaf one, which is using 10111 slash 30. And in this uh, configuration dump, we're just showing you the VLAN uh, SVI configurations for the port. So the, uh, the, these would be the gateways for the, the two hosts that are connected to each, um, each switch, both leaf one and and leaf two, and we're showing that we've got uh, OSPF configured. It's a, it's got neighborship established with spine one at the top, and uh, it's a states in full uh, designated routing. And this is where we're showing uh, each of the loopbacks. So uh, as we showed on the slide in the diagram, so we have uh, the loopback zero address uh, that's uh, configured in the default VRF with with one 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 one, and then also in the uh, VRF one with the, the same uh, same loopback address, and then the same thing on Leaf two, just using 
2222 as the default VRF uh, IP address, and then loopback one has the uh, is attached to VRF one. Okay, and so now we've just dumped the VRF configuration, and so we see the VRF one and default VRF along with the route distinguishers and where we're importing the route distinguisher for the default VRF, but only using the, the, the route map that we'll see in a moment that, that leaks only certain prefixes that, that we care about. Uh, and then the same thing on, on leaf two. Okay, so this is where we're dumping the prefix list that we have configured on both leaf one and leaf two. And you can see where we've got the sequence uh, one permitting the destination uh, loopback address that you see there on both sides, um, and then also the 10.1.1.0 and 20.1.1.0 addresses are the corresponding next hops that are used to reach uh, the, the tunnels. And so we've also configured the route map with the no advertised uh, community option as, as we specified earlier. Okay, and now we'll take a look at the tunnel configuration for both uh, LEAF1 and LEAF2. So we've got the source uh, IP, uh, corresponding source IP and destination IP addresses along with the transport VRF default, specifying the IP address 100.111 and then 100.112 on LEAF2. And we have the MTU configured as well. And this is where we're dumping the the tunnel uh, brief command to check the status of the tunnel and wh whether or not it's up or not. And we can see that tunnel one in both cases is is up and established. And now we're just taking a look at the BGP configuration because again, we're going to configure BGP over these GRE tunnels. And you can see the neighboring uh, addresses that we have there correspond to, uh, the, you know, the neighbors uh, and the, the tunnel uh, IP configuration, and and so we also have uh, BGPs configured as eBGP, so 65200 and 65100, and uh, that could have just as easily have been iBGP as well, and so now we're just dumping the BGP status commands to see if uh, we're established, and so uh, LEAF1's configuration looks good. We, we have got an established connection across the GRE tunnel, and then the same thing on LEAF2. And now we're dumping the routing table for VRF, VRF1 just to make sure that we've got the destination loopback address in the default VRF. And you can see that we do as well as the next hop used to reach that loopback address. And then the same thing with LEAF2. Again, we can see 1111 is found within the default VRF as well as the next hop 2110 uh, in the default VRF. So this is uh, all looking like it should. And we can also see that the destination networks are also reached through tunnel one. So the 105 network and the 205 network are, are reached through the, the tunnel interfaces. And so for VM1, we're just to make sure we can ping the, the gateway. And so the gateway on leaf one is reachable. And now we're going to see if we can reach uh, the VM2's uh, IP address. So you see 205.112, and then we'll ping the reverse way. So we can ping uh, both the gateway and then the address of a VM1. And so we have reachability between those two networks uh, using uh, BGP over GRE tunneling. In these next three slides, we just showed you the sample configurations that we just used in the, uh, the demonstration that we just performed. Uh, so this is just here as a reference for uh, what, what we had in, in the demo. So this is a spine one's configuration. Uh, this is leaf one's configuration. And finally, leaf two's configuration. And with that, we've come to the end of the presentation. I would like to thank you for attending the session and hope this helps you in understanding how BGP or GRE tunnels with IVRL helps with data center deployments.